Good evening from Israel and good afternoon to everyone in the States. Uh, I'm Lahav Harkov, um, and this is Inside the Newsroom from Jewish Insider. Um, I'm here with Richard Goldberg, from, uh, the senior advisor at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, and he was previously the director for countering Iranian weapons of mass destruction for the National Security Council. Uh, he also was a Navy Reserve Intelligence Officer, um, and he was the Republican Staff Director for the Congressional Task Force Against Anti-Semitism. Um, so he has expertise in a lot of areas that are in the news now and of interest uh, to all of you. So I say we dive right in. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. And thanks for everybody uh, taking your lunch or dinner in Israel with us. The top story, Israel-related story in the news right now, is about the U.S. vetoing the Security Council resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire in the war and offering its own resolution for a temporary ceasefire that's basically meant to stop Israel from um, like a large-scale operation in Rafah. What, do you, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, obviously, the resolution that the Algerians uh, had put forward, uh, and they've been pushing for this for a couple of weeks now with the U.S. trying to hold it off, uh, now breaking through uh, to actually force a vote uh, at the Security Council. This is, you know, unvarnished, uh, completely pro-Hamas resolution, right? It's a permanent ceasefire, all, halt all military operations, a lot of blame on Israel for everything. No real mention of the hostages or October 7th and the entirety of, of why we're even in this moment. Uh, so the idea that U.S. would have to veto this resolution or at least should veto this resolution was was quite apparent uh, and commend the Biden administration for following through on the threat to veto it. And they have actually vetoed that resolution. So um, that was sort of you know one of these last gasps of the pro-Hamas contingent and in the international community still trying to push forward uh, that agenda. Uh, ahead of what we all expect to be uh, uh, the next phase of Israel's military campaign in Gaza, and that is going after the southernmost city of Rafah, uh, where we expect Hamas to basically have its last stand with uh, several remaining battalions left that haven't been destroyed yet. Potentially the leaders of Hamas in Gaza, Yahya Sinwar, Mohammed Daif, his deputy, perhaps in the tunnel system uh, around Rafah, more of the hostages potentially being held there as well. And of course, the border with Egypt, which is so important uh, to prevent future smuggling of weapons, people um, that uh, obviously has gone on for years that allowed Hamas to get uh, all of its weaponry from Iran and training. Uh, and so what do we see the U.S. do uh, instead of simply just threatening to veto and vetoing? Uh, for whatever mix of reasons, and there could be some good reasons, some bad reasons, there was an alternative resolution put forward last night by the United States in draft form. Uh, much of it is a restatement of what you've already heard out of the White House as far as U.S. policy. They support a temporary ceasefire under the right circumstances, which is code for a brokered ceasefire with Israel that includes hostages coming out. Uh, they support uh, immediate increase of humanitarian supplies into Gaza. Uh, they call for the uh, release of all the hostages. Uh, there is some criticism of UNRWA uh, in the resolution for its complicity uh, from some of its employees and affiliation with Hamas. I'm sure you've all seen that in the news. At the same time, the resolution supports UNRWA fundamentally, which is problematic for the long term uh, of its existence. But the one operative paragraph that caught my attention, I think it was very unfortunate it was uh, the U.S. taking a position that you've already heard about uh, from the White House podium now moving into a U.N. Security Council resolution uh, opposing Israeli military action against Rafah. Uh, it says under current circumstances, whatever that means. Now, they well, might wanna... say, well, legal. Go ahead. I just want to back up to something you had mentioned, because you said they were calling for a temporary ceasefire under the right circumstances, like a release of the hostages. And right. we see now that um, Hamas has been making demands that even President Biden called over the top. And at least from what Israeli sources are saying, they're not backing down from those demands, which is why Israel is not taking the talks particularly seriously at this point, because they feel that Hamas isn't being serious. So if there's no realistic ceasefire, then even according to the Security Council resolution, Israel could proceed in Rafa in theory. Correct. Or I not understand. Well, well if, if that's all it said, that would be true. But there is an explicit 
paragraph just dedicated to opposing Israeli military okay. action in Rafa outright. And that I think is highly problematic. Um, I think that that should not have been put forward into a UN Security Council resolution. I think Hamas reads that and says, oh, the U.S. is pushing all it can against Israel from going into Rafa. Why do we need to get serious in talks to release hostages? Uh, if you were really in a negotiation here, you would want Israel to have as much leverage as possible with Hamas, as much existential fear of its destruction as possible to force any concessions out of Hamas. So uh, I don't know why we, we've gone down this path. It might just be U.S. policy and we can have the disagreement over that. It might be somebody in a room in New York thought this was really smart of how to get our allies not to be upset with us that we were vetoing a bad resolution. So we'll come up with like the diet version of a bad resolution in its place. Um, and we'll be for that while we veto the worst one. You know, to me, if I was running the show at, at USUN, I would say, let's just have a steady stream of resolutions we put forward and we force Russia and China to veto them. Unconditional release of the hostages. It's all a resolution just on that. I'd love to see our allies say we won't support that resolution and force Russia and China against that. Add Hamas to the UN list of sanctions to be recognized as a terrorist organization. The EU already has it. The UK has it. US has it. Force Russia and China to veto that. We don't play any offense here. We're just in this crouched position of playing defense and being afraid we're being isolated by the pro-Hamas contingent. And if you do that, yes, you continue to be isolated and you come up with more alternatives. Do you think there's a chance that Russia and China will veto this U.S. resolution because, I don't know, it's criticism of UNRWA or whatever language it uses about Hamas or something like that? Well, the, like the it sounds bad to us, but does it sound bad to them, too? I, I think it's, unfortunately, it's a starting point for negotiation if the U.S. wanted to actually push forward the draft, right? They've just circulated the draft last night. They leaked it out for right. the first time ahead of the vote. So you can imagine it would get watered down further There'll be, you know, if this would be, if this actually became a vehicle where people say, okay, we'll negotiate off of your draft, this is the strongest the draft will ever be. Um, so, do I think the U.S. is actually pushing for this draft? They've made comments saying that they're in no hurry to push this forward. It's hanging out there. Um, is this was this just a tactical device to have something to point to while they tried to peel other votes in the Security Council? down below that nine vote threshold uh, in, in hopes of not having to use the veto, maybe. Uh, but they've set a precedent here of putting into a Security Council resolution draft after we oppose Israel going to Rafa. And again, it says under current circumstances. So I think they would say back, well, if Israel presents to us a, a coherent plan that we're confident in of how they're going to move with the place persons out of Rafa and mitigate civilian casualties, and the Egyptians are satisfied with what they're going to do with the border, we, we could still support it. It doesn't preclude us from supporting under the right circumstances. Uh, but, you know, that's not what the headline is out of this. That's not what Hamas is reading out of this. That's not what world newspapers are reporting out of it. So I want to go back to what you said about leverage in negotiation with the hostages. Um, it, I've done a lot of reporting on Qatar's role in this whole war um, as a major funder and supporter of Hamas, and now, in theory, the mediator, um, you know, as, as fair a mediator as someone can be when they're funding one side. Um, and just before we started this call, um, Qatar said that Hamas told them that it is now distributing medication to the hostages. Now, notably, this happened a few days <laughs> after IDF soldiers found you know, the medicines labeled with people's names on it, with hostages' names on it that had not been delivered to them. Um, so, you know, I personally <laughs> don't believe it at all. I mean, it just sounds like, you know, ridiculous. But in terms of like what Qatar is doing in these mediations, I guess, uh, at, do you think that they are pushing Hamas in any way to try to release the hostages? Um, what do you think their interests are sort of in this game when it comes to the hostage negotiations? Because just a few days ago, um, I believe it was the prime minister of Qatar who said that, you know, the war should end even without the hostages getting out. Yeah, so uh, I'm pretty public on this from early on, uh, post-October 7th. People want to look up uh, Wall Street Journal op-ed October 31st, uh, ultimatum for Qatar. Um, 
And it was my belief, and I think others see this way as well, that the Qataris are loyal allies of Hamas. This is an ideological ally. They have supported Hamas long before they took uh, in the Politburo into Doha, Qatar back in 2012. What their narrative out of Qatar today is, we're only doing what the U.S. and Israel asked us to do. You know, Hamas was put here in Doha at U.S. requests under the Obama administration, and then Netanyahu even came to us and said, can you pour more money into Gaza to help prop up this government? And we're, we're just going along with what we've been asked to do. And you tell us the new there's new policy. We'll, we'll, we'll do it. But, you know, we do have the relationship now, so we should use it, right? I mean, don't don't tell us to stop supporting Hamas if, if you need to get the hostages. We'll be with you. We'll help you. And in fact, it was like the arsonist playing firefighter within hours of October 7th in the news that all these hostages were taken, who shows up at the doorstep to say, hey, we can help you, we're your ally, Qataris, to make sure they're the mediator, they're the go-between for Hamas, their ally. But the truth is, way back before 2012, you go back to the civil war uh, in Gaza that when Hamas defeated Fatah and took control of the Strip, you go back before that, you will see all the public evidence, it's all Googleable of Qatari financial and political support for Hamas. And this is not just about financial support for Hamas, it's this entire Islamic, Sunni Islamic extremist networks uh, throughout the Middle East that they have historically supported, ISIS affiliates, Al Qaeda affiliates. Uh, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed famously was working and hiding out in Qatar in the 1990s. The US was going to go get him before 9-11. And it was the Qatari interior minister who tipped him off and said, get out of here, go to Pakistan before the Americans come. So this is not just sort of like we woke up October 7th and Qataris are our allies and, and they're going to try to help us. They are fundamentally not a neutral arbiter. If you have been an ideological supporter of Hamas for decades, if you are a supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood for decades, if you are the sponsor of Al Jazeera, which we see on the ground providing material support to Hamas. In fact, their journalists in Gaza are Hamas commanders, we have learned, finally been exposed. And yet, it's still business as usual for Al Jazeera. By the way, amazing. We find 12 employees of UNRWA who are Hamas members involved in October 7th. We've suspended funding. We're talking about reforming UNRWA finally. Al Jazeera reporters are Hamas commanders in Gaza, Nobody's shutting down Al Jazeera. Nobody's changing Al Jazeera. Nobody's even calling for it. It's crazy. Um, all sponsored by the Altani family in, in Doha, Qatar. So the idea that they would be in charge of arbitrating a dispute here on behalf of their client, their ally, and the U.S. or Israel to get hostages out means from day one, you have been working against yourself. Anything that they're communicating, anything that they're trying to negotiate will ultimately be for Hamas's advantage to survive uh, beyond this conflict. And so a lot of people say, well, they, we didn't we have a ceasefire for a week and 100 hostages got released? And isn't that wonderful? And shouldn't Qatar get credit for it? No. Hamas won a ceasefire for a week. And they still held on to more than 100 hostages. And they wouldn't continue with the process because they had gotten what they had wanted out of the ceasefire. And we haven't seen one again since. So for the Qataris, my ultimate question has always been, oh, if you come to the table and say, oh, we have so much leverage, we have so much we can give you on the hostage talks, well, then use it or face consequences. And if you come back to us and say, well, it's out of our hands, we don't have control, we can't force Hamas to do anything, then you're having it both ways. You don't have leverage, which means there should be consequences now if you don't cut off your support to Hamas. Uh, so I, I think we're at a day of reckoning for our relationship with the Qataris. They do not have us over a barrel like their echo chamber would want us to believe. We have an air base, the Combined Air Operations Center outside Doha that we established right after 9-11. We poured so much money into expanding that facility. It's a major artery for our air operations in the Middle East, unquestioned. It can be moved. It doesn't have to be in Doha, Qatar. There are a lot of people, military experts, who think it's unwise to have such an important base so close to Iran when Iran is the long-term threat to the U.S. in the region. Certainly the Saudis, who are asking for an upgrade in U.S. defense relationships, could afford moving a base into Saudi Arabia or the Emirates uh, to an existing base called al-Dafra that we could expand. So they don't have us over any barrel. 
They are the size of a little fingertip in your pinky sticking out into the Persian Gulf, made rich by oil and gas. And they need us more than we need them ultimately. Now, it's a little bit complicated in the LNG market with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and U.S. policies against American LNG that are that are hurting our, our leverage here in the relationship in the energy market to an extent. But ultimately, from a security perspective, the grand picture for the Qataris, we have a lot of leverage to say and support for Islamic terrorists and support for Hamas, turn over the Hamas leaders, shut down what Al Jazeera is doing, or we'll subject Al Jazeera to sanctions or criminal prosecution. We don't do any of it. We don't do any of it. And your reporting and others tells us why. Billions of dollars spent on their image, on lobbyists, on NGOs that you don't even know they're funding, on universities, on think tanks in Washington. Their influence network is massive. The people who you see on television who defend Qatar, you may not even know they have conflicts of interest being paid by parts of the Qatari apparatus. So it's a big problem. It's a big problem. I've said it from day one, and I'll, I was on a soapbox, I'll stay up. I'm very disappointed in major Jewish organizations who have not stood up and vocally said this about the Qataris from day one, and some who continue to stay silent under the mistaken influence of Qatari paid agents who are telling them, don't criticize Qatar, it might hurt the hostages. No, it won't. Your silence hasn't delivered the hostages 136 days later. Maybe try something else. You know, you said that, uh, that like the reckoning has come, and I wonder though if it really is coming. Like, there's definitely some movements in Congress, even bipartisan movement in Congress, letters, things like that. But do you think that the the Biden administration that feels this anything close to what you're describing? I mean, it just seems like business as usual with them, like very mild criticism. It it does. I mean, this is a bipartisan problem. Uh, I'm not going to completely blame the Biden administration. The Trump administration has fault here, too. Who did we yeah. use as an interlocutor with the Taliban and allowed there to be an embassy of the Taliban in Doha and talks well, to normalize? Well, the Trump administration the also negotiated, oh, like, the end of the boycott. And by the way, yeah. And by the way, that what a great example of what a folly this entire process is. Look what happened in Afghanistan. The entire premise was that the Qataris were going to be the intermediary. They're playing this helpful role. They're going to help normalize, uh, influence uh, the Taliban to be responsible stakeholders to govern in Afghanistan. It's a joke. It's a complete joke. They led us into a process that handed Afghanistan ultimately to the Taliban and to Al-Qaeda and the rise of ISIS-K in Afghanistan. It's going to be a major terror threat for a decade or more. People don't even understand we're likely to face another 9-11 right now because of our withdrawal from Afghanistan. The Qataris are complicit in it. And now we have the same exact story playing out with Hamas. Have we not learned our lesson? Apparently not. You have big interest in DOD to defend the base because it's easier to simply keep the base there. They have the relationships. They have the military construction done. They planned around it. It would be a huge headache to have to move that base. So DOD opposes anything that stresses the Qatari relationship. And then you have everybody else who, you know, is in sort of this influence network who have been played by the Qataris for years. It's amazing. In the There is a hostage cottage industry. And you've picked up on your reporting. And I hope everybody reads your report on the Richardson Center. It was amazing. And I've continued to dig into this since your report. The Qataris just show up in all of these random hostage deals that we've been doing yeah. for years. Venezuela, Burma. Somehow the Americans have to be flown to Doha first and then turned over to the... What do the Qataris have in common with any of these countries? It's weird. I could tell they, you that they pay for... I mean, again, they have nothing in common. This doesn't really explain it, but they pay for the private plane so that the Richardson Center or whoever flies by way of Doha. And then in all the news articles, Doha's mentioned. Like, that's what they're playing at. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. I think of, I can't remember like the TV show, but it's kind of like one of these like law and order dramas where somebody is like this like teenager who keeps like showing up at like arson scenes as a witness and tries to like help the cops. Like, oh, I can help you. I think I know something. Or did you check this? And by the end of the episode, the cops finally figure out that the kid is actually the arsonist because he keeps showing up at all the crime scenes and knows a little too much. That's how it feels. That's what I think Cutter is. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's always something to do that. So I want to, there, there's sort of a new, an old new element in the hostage negotiations, which is that the talks right now are taking place in Cairo. Now, years ago, the Egyptians used to be the sort of mediators between Israel and Hamas. And, you know, the Egyptians are not exactly Zionist, but they don't like Hamas either. So it seems a little bit more fair to have them be in the middle. Um, do you think the fact that talks are happening in Cairo is a positive development? There's good and bad here. Um, I think it's a notable development first. I think it's important to say that. We have now shifted from Doha to Cairo, uh, which I think is taking the Qataris down a peg. Maybe this is Saudi influence. Maybe it's Israeli influence. Maybe there is U.S. influence, and I'm not giving the Biden administration enough credit for it. Um, but the fact that we are now not having talks in Doha, and then suddenly it was in Europe, and now it's actually in Cairo, does mean there is some sort of shift in influence going on, more likely for the day after scenario, not for the current situation. You see this, the Qataris are still involved. They're being flown into Cairo. They're still involved in these talks. They're mentioned. Uh, but Cairo is taking ownership because they will ultimately have a major role to play in what happens next in Gaza because they will occupy the only shared border that is open, most likely. If the Israelis are con uh, constructing a buffer zone around Gaza, there may not be a border crossing really from Israel into Gaza in any economic sense. The, the Mediterranean will be highly patrolled for potential for smuggling. Obviously, the, the Rafa border will be tightly controlled, but if there's going to be an economic future, it's going to run through Egypt more than anything else. How do you do that with Israeli control of that border crossing? Will there be long-term Israeli border control? Will the Egyptians be stepping out in some ways under U.S. and Israeli auspices to monitor what they do and to verify that they're acting against smuggling if the Israelis, for some reason, don't want to have to control the border long-term or Egypt doesn't want them to? These are a lot of conversations that are taking place. And then um, with the Saudis, are going to be pouring in a lot of money with the Emirates into the rebuilding of Gaza and the behind the scenes, who's in charge of Gaza and or what do they call it? Revitalized Palestinian Authority. I hate that term, the RPA. I, this is like the new buzzword in Israel and in closed doors in Washington, the RPA, reformed, revitalized Palestinian Authority that takes control of the West Bank and Gaza under more Saudi auspices. The Israelis have said, we, we're not allowing the Qataris any day after role, and rightly so. I mean, they've been the sponsor. They're an ally of Hamas. They're not going to put a dime into Gaza. To but unfortunately, Israel been like, was the enabler of that for the past decade plus. Like, we shouldn't say, you shouldn't let Israel get all yeah. uh, scot-free oh, on the sorry. Qatari front. Hey, why is it that the Israelis were the ones who were hushing people up for the for the first few weeks after October 7th and the Mossad director and the former Mossad director is doing shuttle diplomacy in and out of yeah. Doha and, you know, trying to encourage people, don't criticize the Qataris, they're going to help us. I, I mean, they my... absolutely yeah. have complicity in this. Absolutely. It's, it is shameful. And by the way, those same Mossad people are still out there saying this with all the evidence in front of them to the contrary. And it really hurts their credibility. Uh, people who are, I've respected for a long time because of operations in Iran and things like that. This really shows either a great deal of naivete or some sort of conflict of interest at play. So, yes, I take your point there. There's no, but if we've come to a new policy reality of, ooh, Qatar shouldn't be involved in Gaza, uh, I, I support that. Um, I have a piece in Commentary Magazine in the January issue you can all see called Five Things That Can't Can't Come Next in Gaza. And one of them was piece. no role yeah. for the Qataris or the Turks. Yeah. You know, I think that there's like a almost a lack of imagination, which is unfortunate because I feel like Israel's you know, the Mossad and Shabak are, were once known for their incredible creativity. But there's, you know, when it came to the Qataris and the Qatari funding, there was sort of a lack of imagination of how to stop Gaza from collapsing in a humanitarian crisis over the years. And now I feel like the same thing is happening again with UNRWA, right, where we all know that UNRWA employees support terrorism. We all know, I mean, you know, there's this sort of ideological, like, narrative issue where they keep the Palestinians in this eternal victimhood status. We know that they're a problem. And yet you see COGAT, which for those who don't know, it's the, it's like a military slash civilian office that like does the, like they, they govern basically 
the West Bank and then the borders between Israel and Gaza, um, that they're like behind the scenes advocating for UNRWA to continue to have a role because they say, well, nobody else is equipped right now to provide the humanitarian aid to Gaza. What do you think the alternatives should be? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I've worked on UNRWA oversight reform efforts for about 20 years now. Since I first came to Washington, it was in my portfolio. And every single time you try to do something, um, write a letter, do an amendment, do a bill, the pushback from the State Department was so immense to try to rescue UNRWA to protect it from obvious uh, necessary forms was always breathtaking to me. Um, there was one point at which we appropriated out of the Congress a million dollars to give the Government Accounting uh, Accountability Office the money to conduct an expenditure audit of UNRWA's books. UNRWA said they would never submit to it. The UN said they weren't allowed to do it. The money still, you know, sat there, uh, never used, and we never got an outside independent audit of UNRWA. In 2012 went into the uh, Foreign Operations Subcommittee. This was uh, with a Senate staffer at the time. We proposed an amendment that this, just asking for the number of people served by UNRWA who were alive in 1948, right? Just like basic census, like you think it's a refugee agency, like how many people are actually there? Oh my gosh, the, the, you would think we were starting World War III, the Temple Mount had been blown up by a radical group. The Jordanian ambassador calling and screaming, don't do this. You're going to set the Middle East on fire. State Department writing letters. The Deputy Secretary of State, now our CIA director, opposing this uh, uh, strongly. And I was like, what? what is going on? We can't get a basic number out of how many people you serve of a certain demographic? I mean, this is nuts. And over time, I came to believe that this is not a reformable organization. Um, it does not recognize Hamas as a terrorist organization, neither does any other UN agency, but it becomes really problematic when your agency is not international in nature, it's just local, locally based, locally employed with 30,000 employees uh, between all the areas it serves. And its mission is not to move people into a post-refugee status, it's to keep people as refugees as long as possible. Its uh, textbook, its education system takes the Palestinian Authority textbooks, which we all know uh, promotes incitement against Jews in Israel. It indoctrinates a generation after generation into the belief that they will one day wait for the Arab armies to come back, wash the Jews into the sea, return to their homeland, take take Jewish homes back uh, to be their own. It is a manifest destiny, a vision of October 7th, institutionalized into a UN agency with no counterterrorism controls whatsoever. In fact, collaboration, implicity, with the terrorist organization. And it's not just Gaza. It's in Judea and Samaria, in the camps you see there, where the IDF has to operate every day, like Janine. Go up to Lebanon, the largest uh, UNRWA refugee camp in Lebanon called Ain al Hilwe. There's no Jews there. There's no Israelis there. It has been the site of crazy terror battles for months, going back to last summer, with displaced families left and right. Like, why? Um, and so to me, you just has to, this is not sustainable. The population grows every single year because supposedly refugee status just keeps going on indefinitely. So the more kids you have, the more refugees you have, we, the taxpayers. So we have the international supermodel refugees. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, by the way, there's 2 million in Jordan who yeah. are also just Jordanian citizens at this point. And yet we subsidize the Jordanian budget by keeping them called refugees and pouring money into UNRWA, into Jordan, which is why Jordan opposes all of this reform behind the scene and is one of the unspoken reasons why the U.S. opposes the reform, because the Jordanians fear if they allow for UNRWA to be gone, then the refugee issue is gone. And then their whole narrative of fighting for the Palestinians inside Jordan is gone and they fear for the collapse of the kingdom. It's a big, big problem. Um, there's but, so much to say about the problems with Jordan. There's alternatives. Belief. There's alternatives yeah. to your question. There's alternatives. Not that I love these agencies because they don't recognize Hamas either, but at least they're international in nature and aren't built yeah. to keep the problem. Uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. They know how to deal with internally displaced people. They do it all around the world every single day. UNICEF, the World Food Program, ugh, the World Health Organization. Yes, the Red Cross. Ugh. 
but they're already there. They're on the ground. This isn't hard. You just divert the money. You just say you're now in charge and you put the UN High Commissioner for Refugees as the lead organizing agency with the mandate of getting people back on their feet post-war, moving internally displaced people back to their homes, and then shifting responsibility to the host government. And this is where I'll, I'll end on this. There is a pro-Palestinian, pro-Palestinian state argument for dismantling UNRWA. And that is you're depriving Palestinians of their basic human economic rights by keeping them downtrodden as refugees. And you are removing a basic element of statehood building by saying half the population of a future Palestinian state will be wards of the UN, not the responsibility of that Palestinian state. How could you possibly believe the Palestinian Authority is built to govern if half the population is governed by UNRWA? So let's talk about the Palestinian Authority and its ability to govern. Um, there's all these rumors that the U.S. might be considering unilaterally recognizing a Palestinian state. Um, unclear if they're going to do that or not, but certainly the Obama administration came very close to doing that. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me that many people who served in the Obama administration would also think that's a reasonable thing to do. Um, at the same time, they want to do it in a package together with normalization of Saudi Arabia. So I guess I have I have two questions for you. Number one, do you think that the Biden administration thinks that that's like that a Palestinian state is actually going to rise up from the ashes here? Like, is that actually something that they think could happen? And and two, is there hope for Saudi normalization if you know clearly there's not going to be a viable Palestinian state even if it's declared? Like, is 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 there a real chance for normalization here? Yeah, I think the two questions are somewhat linked. Yeah. Um, so I'll take the last one first and back into it. Um, I think there is a chance for Saudi-Israel normalization. I think that's on the table. I think all parties have an interest in getting a deal for various reasons. The Saudis have an interest in securing a democratic president who was anti-Saudi, anti-Mohammed bin Salman, delivering the keys to the kingdom for U.S.-Saudi defense relations, potentially a treaty of some kind, uh, nuclear cooperation that might include enrichment on Saudi soil. These are big ticket items that the Saudis, I don't think, ever thought they might get from Joe Biden. But if they could, um, they would want them and they would want to uh, give certain things in return to get um, this massive commitment from the United States. The U.S. obviously wants this deal. Because I think what the U.S. and the White House's vision is, they get a ceasefire in Gaza. There's no Rafah operation. The Israelis figure out how to deal with Rafah without invading long term. There's a siege, there's special operations, whatever it is. But the war is kind of over quickly. There's a hostage deal that helps us sell that. They move to a deal uh, with Hezbollah and Lebanon is the northern border. That again is a face saving bunch of um, uh, lipstick on a pig type concessions from Hezbollah uh, gives the Israeli population some false confidence that they can return to their homes in the north and won't have an October 7th on the northern border. Everybody wins. Um, there's no there's no escalation. There's a ceasefire essentially on the north and no major conflict in Lebanon. And then in that environment of things quieting down, Never having changed the Iran policy, by the way, and continuing to pay the Iranians not to go across the 90% nuclear threshold on, on uranium enrichment, the Saudis come in, they get a commitment from the Israelis to a two-state solution. Long term, it's negotiated in some way that gives the Saudis the confidence to say that they've gotten something out of Israel, and they're the ones that are going to be the lead in rebuilding Gaza and reforming the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and in exchange for all the American commitments, everybody, you know, puts the puts the ribbon on the present and then there's a big win and everybody celebrates Saudi Israel normalization. It's historic. And the Israelis want that, obviously, because it's a, a strategic refutation to Iran post October 7th. Um, for those that believe Hamas or Iran, it, uh, Iran's direction, potentially, or uh, the coalition of, of Iran's proxies led by Nasrallah, perhaps. We're looking to disrupt this process of normalization for, on behalf of the Islamic Republic of Iran. This would be real undermining of Tehran to say your entire propaganda, your thesis, 
um, the idea behind the revolution and, and what you are trying to export through the Middle East has been dramatically undermined, and then other Muslim nations follow. Um, certainly would be a paradigm shift. The question is, what is Israel being asked to give up, and do they need to make the deal right now? If the Saudis long-term want to normalize with Israel, which has certainly been my understanding for years of going there, uh, because they see the region having changed, they want the long-term economic benefit of integrating with Israel for Vision 2030 that Mohammed bin Salman has been so focused on, and the stability of the kingdom long-term. Um, and and they know that if Donald Trump wins the White House, it's not like he's going to be opposed to Saudi-Israel normalization. He's going to view it as an expansion of the Abraham Accord. So they, and and obviously we might see the return of a maximum pressure campaign on Iran. A stronger support anyways on the defense commitments to Saudi Arabia. So they they don't necessarily lose by going to today in Saudi Arabia. They, they gain the benefit of a democratic president and trying to create bipartisanship in the support for U.S.-Saudi relations, which they would deem important. But they're not necessarily going to lose everything if they wait. Joe Biden might still do the deal after November if he's reelected. The Israelis know all this. They want the normalization deal, but at what cost? And by the way, who's the most desperate party in all of this? Maybe it's Washington. Maybe it's the president who's trying to de-escalate in the region, contain, get all these ceasefires, get everybody to agree to do nothing, to, and then suddenly come out with a rabbit, which is Middle East peace, and he's turned chaos into, into historic uh, victory and, and, and peace. Well, if, if the president wants to deliver this normalization deal so badly, then that means to me Jerusalem actually holds a lot of cards. And rather than having to bend to the demands of Washington and Riyadh on things about a Palestinian state, they could say, no, no, this is this is the limit. This is what we're willing to do. And the last thing I'll say on the Palestinian state issue broadly is that the disconnect between the center left in Washington and the center left in Israel has never been wider in any time in history. There had always been a trend of the American left and the Israeli left separating on security issues since the Intifada. And the American left at its fringes really had just stayed in the 1990s and could never adapt to a reality where Israel was just like, yeah, there's suicide bombings every single day. We're never going back to certain things. Um, but there was still an openness to a process. There were ways of talking about things. There were people who were willing to have conversations who were leaders of parties on the center left of Israel. When you see Benny Gantz get up at a conference this week and declare there will not be a Palestinian state, you know, this we're not going to reward the Palestinians after October 7th. Not the Netanyahu government talking. That's not the right wing. It's not Smotrich and Ben Gvir, which is the talking point of the American left today in attacking Israel for not recognizing a Palestinian state. This is all of Israel. And I was just there. I mean, I could feel it in these meetings. People who viscerally hate Bibi Netanyahu will slam the table, you know, also to say, we're not going to give them a Palestinian state. Um, you're there. You you know this better than I do. It's just, this is not a, a right-left issue. It's an Israeli issue at this point. And I don't know that the mainstream of the Democratic Party in America gets that based on their rhetoric today. I mean, I think that that was true in many ways, even before 10 7, like when the Bennett Lapid government was elected and, and they thought, oh, we're going to be welcomed with open arms and embraced in Washington. Right. And right. I was like, there's still some big differences of opinion between Yair Lapid and the Democrats. And so this has made it even, you know, made the gap even wider. But I also think that there's like a, a gap between like the expectation of the Palestinians and what's happening on the ground with the Palestinians. Cause I think like they could say revitalize Palestinian authority all they want, but it, it would take like a real sea change, like a transformation. It's not something that's going to happen in a month, you know? So uh, it's a, <laughs> it's like, they seem like disconnected from what's happening on the ground in many ways. But um, I want to ask you one more question. That's my question before we get to some of the audience questions, because we are starting to run out of time, but we, have not gotten into Iran very much. Um, and they are very important. They're standing, they're sort of behind a lot of the things that have happened here, whether it's Lebanon and Hezbollah, which you sort of touched on briefly, um, and of course Hamas itself. And and as we as our focus is on Gaza and Hamas, they're continuing 
you know, making headway on their nuclear program. So what needs to happen now? Yeah, it is a shame because as we've gotten so much farther from October 7th, 136 days in now, we really don't talk about Iran very much. Um, and, and it's strategically a failure uh, on all of our parts that that is the case. I think in the first few weeks, it was very much a focus on Iran, Iran's war on Israel, what is happening through the region, how everything is connected. Hamas on October 7th, Hezbollah and everything you see today on the northern border, the proxies attacking Americans and Israelis out of Iraq or Syria, the Houthis in Yemen owned and owned, owned and controlled by the Iranians, trained by Hezbollah for years, this massive threat to the Red Sea and commercial shipping. All of it, the ring of fire, as they call it, that the Supreme Leader created to surround Israel, but also take control of the Middle East, wrest it from the United States influence, and secure some some sort of deterrence, um, create this threat to be able to continue on its nuclear advances with less fear of U.S. or Israeli pushback in some way, or being able to distract us all while they pursue that. My colleague, Mark Dubowitz, I think you've all heard from in a previous Inside the Newsroom, has a great line where he says, in some ways, October 7th was the weapon of great uh, of mass distraction, while Iran continues its pursuit of weapons of mass destruction. I think that's right. Uh, and so... We are monitoring, obviously, the reporting out of the IAEA, the UN nuclear watchdog. Uh, we just saw a story yesterday with the director general alerting the world that uh, Iran's continuing its production of high enriched uranium at 60% level purity. That is a stone's throw from 90% weapons grade uranium. It actually can be used itself in a crude nuclear device, uh, but also it can be very quickly uh, enriched higher to 90%. They have a stockpile large enough to basically build a dozen bombs or so over a few weeks time, uh, a long weekend, they produce one. Um, they have to actually build a weapon, whether it is a formal nuclear weapon that is, uh, um, you know, supposed to be delivered in some way on a missile that would take a certain amount of time or a crew device. They just want to go out to the desert and go boom. And everybody wake up to a CNN report about, you know, there's some massive, um, uh, number on the Richter scale that inside of Iran and a lot of people are saying there was a nuclear test and then the game changes, right? Just like North Korea, the game just changes. They have the capability. Uh, there's, you know, worry that they could just have a malfunction in a nuclear enrichment plant, delay inspectors while they divert uh, certain um, types of uranium or, or go to 90% before the IAEA would know about it. Um, they have potentially crash centrifuge plants they've set up because for two plus years now, we've had no insight into their centrifuge manufacturing. One of the things they limited over the last three years uh, as part of their uh, pushback um, by the administration and their escalation of the nuclear program. So I'm very worried about it. Uh, I would say that in the past, I was very bullish on a maximum pressure campaign that combined economic pressure with political support for the people inside of Iran overt actions, military deterrence, you know, the basic elements you you remember of the, of the maximum pressure campaign being effective in potentially destabilizing the country enough to uh, make them have to choose uh, and not pursue this course. Um, I believe that we might be beyond that point in time based on the last three years of advances. Uh, they have a large uh, underground facility under construction near Natanz that is reportedly supposed to be impenetrable to military strike um, buried very far underground. It's still in construction. There's no public timeline on how long they have left until that facility is sort of at its red line of uh, you won't be able to destroy the facility. And if they move their enrichment uh, capabilities in there, it could be a, a game-changing situation. I'm keeping my eye on that facility for a potential military strike by Israel in the future. Uh, but I think we should be sober enough to say, our strategy for Iran might need to shift now, where there is a military option available for the nuclear program long term uh, and a maximum pressure campaign type situation for Iran and all its other threats. Right? It's still the leading state sponsor of terrorism. It's still kidnapping people. It's still assassinating people or trying to. It's still building out its missile forces and spreading their missiles throughout the Middle East. There is a reason to deny resources to this regime no matter what whether they have a nuclear program or not, it's still a very dangerous regime 
uh, at war with the United States, as we have seen, in cooperation now even closer with Russia and with China against U.S. interests. So I would call it pressure and deter, pressure this regime to deny it resources for all of its malign activities, and military deterrence being the lead solution long-term for its nuclear program, with the decision possibly having to be taken by whoever is next president. All right, I'm gonna get into audience questions now. This is one that was sent in advance. What can be done to launch meaningful pushback against the Biden Blinken uh, trying to impose a Palestinian state on Israel? Well, obviously in Congress, you are seeing pushback um, more from the Republican side, but still some Democrats um, that, that you have. Uh, so to the extent that Congress puts forward a resolution that rejects this idea in some way, there's a letter, bipartisan letter that goes forward. These are things that matter. Um, I, I do think there is also a, a question that I would ask Democrats who are not in the radical camp, who are mainstream Democrats who are thoughtful, generally supportive of Israel, but may feel squeezed in this moment um, by where the president is at, where maybe they've been at historically. Uh, is it a good thing for the Palestinians for the question of their statehood to be purely partisan in Washington? Is that going to be it? If there's a Republican president, we de-recognize the Palestinian right to a state. If there's a Democratic president, we recognize it. Um, if there's a Republican president, their capital is not Jerusalem. If there's a Democratic president, their capital is Jer I mean, all these things are like big question marks to me of the sustainability for the Palestinians long term. Uh, and what that means security wise, hum you know, just for their own uh, humanitarian issues uh, inside Palestinian territory. So I think it's very, very, very misguided to pursue an agenda on this type of issue that doesn't have bipartisan support. And it does not today. It does not. That is one of the strongest arguments, in my view, for the Biden administration being pulled back and being asked by Democrats, don't do this. Don't do this is not in the interest of the region. It's not good for Israel. It's not good for the Palestinians. This has to be done in a bipartisan way, whatever that would end up looking like. Um, the second piece is that, you know, Congress also holds the purse strings. And so um, there is a, a possibility of putting riders into appropriations bills. And there's going to be a CR that's coming up and continuing resolution. They're still negotiating over a longer term fiscal year 2024 bill. Um they still have the supplemental that's being bantered about, whether that will ever happen. There are opportunities to put prohibitions and language into that bill that ties the administration's hands, that makes it very difficult for them to pursue this agenda. Now, ultimately, the president has a lot of prerogative in foreign policy. Would we see at some point uh, an Obama moment like the end of 2016, where he goes to the Security Council and supports a resolution? that recognizes this and moves the goalposts in the international community. Yeah, it's possible. It's a logical conclusion of where Obama was at when he left office. Um, it would be really bad. It would be really bad. I would hope that members of Congress would would ask him not to do that. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, if you're facing broad political opposition in Israel from left to right, uh, you're facing bipartisan opposition, maybe more Republicans, but some Democrats as well in Washington, this, this is not a sustainable policy. It's not a good idea. It's not a good idea as merits. It's not a good idea politically. So um, that that's why I, I can I can list out all the reasons why it's a bad idea. You, you probably already can list them yourself, whoever asked the question, but that's what I think needs to happen. It needs, it needs to, the president needs to face strong bipartisan pushback. So on, a, on another topic, um, you know, we know Qatar used to ha actually have diplomatic relations with Israel, right? There was, a, I think it was an economic office of Israel in Doha. Um, and of course, things have soured a lot since then. So um, we have this question here from Karen Berman, uh, where she said, how do we know that Saudi Arabia or countries that joined the Abraham Accords are not really Qatar's uh, in sheep's clothing? Uh, it is a great question. Um, as far, it, it, in some ways, it, what's funny about your question is that I actually often say uh, Qatar is the new Saudi Arabia. Um, so it's a little bit of an inverse. Mohammed bin Salman, when he took uh, power as crown prince, uh, and we went through several years of a major rift between the Saudis and the Qataris, 
showed his views and his principles on the Muslim Brotherhood, on radical Islamic networks, and on uh, countries that still support them. And so he went through a long process inside Saudi Arabia of trying to get rid of all of the most radical elements of the Islamic councils that make decisions, the Muslim World League, for those who've ever been on a trip to Saudi Arabia, maybe you've met with uh, the head of the Muslim World League, uh, Mohammed al-Issa, who was installed by MBS uh, to take over the organization. This was the global Muslim organization that was funding madrasas, the textbooks around the world, all the horror things that we knew about the Saudis doing for years uh, to support Wahhabism throughout the world, not just in Saudi Arabia. Rooting all that out, trying to get rid of that funding, finding out who were the radical schools that they were funding around the world, trying to get control of the textbooks. I haven't gotten 100% verification that like here's here's like the spreadsheet of the schools we've went through, et cetera. But they talk a very good game, a very different game than ever before. They used to just deny this was going on. Now they say it's absolutely going on and we're, we're doing everything possible to stop it. They sent up these, you know, uh, extremism centers. You remember Trump's visit with the hands on the globe that was at this uh, counter extremism center. Um, they participated in the counter ISIS campaign uh, militarily. So uh, there are a lot of indicators that the Saudis had been doing better, not to say that they're doing perfectly. Um, still possible there were, and we've heard reports of Hamas sort of front companies and stock investments and stuff that might've been in Saudi Arabia in addition to elsewhere in the Gulf, quite possible. Um, need, to, need to look at that. But there's no active state sponsorship that we can discern at this point for these organizations. In fact, the Muslim Brotherhood is viewed as a as an enemy to the Saudi regime, um, the same way that the Egyptians view the Muslim Brotherhood as an enemy. So Hamas is that's never going to happen um, with with the Saudis. The Qataris are different. They are different. They are not um, opposed to the Muslim Brotherhood. Quite the opposite. They are aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood. Now you can come up with all kinds of reasons and people are saying, oh, they're not ideological. They're just transactional. Oh, they're in a tough neighborhood. They're just trying to protect them. Well, well, their neighbors aren't doing that. And Al Jazeera, I come back to as really sort of the proof in the pudding that exposes everything. Why would you have your state-funded TV organization, your news center, be just spewing such hate and incitement against moderate Arab countries, the United States, Israel, Jews on a daily basis? Why would you allow that organization to be doing what it does in Gaza right now with Hamas? It doesn't add up. You know, you're you're opposed to Islamic radicalism, you're opposed to Hamas, you're opposed to terrorism. Mm, doesn't really look like it to me. So, yes, uh, any evidence of support for terrorism from any other supposed U.S. ally um, should have a harsh consequence from the United States. But at the moment, you know, with obviously Dubai being an exception where there's a lot of transshipment and sanctions evasion that goes on, and we try to have tough talks with the Emiratis um, in the past and need to continue doing that. And there are various reasons why the Emirates have been problematic on sanctions evasion. Uh, the Saudis at this point up until last year were not problematic in my view from my assessment. Now, the deal they had to cut with the Iranians the deal they cut with the Houthis, their posture shifting over the last year since those deals, um, I think has become problematic uh, in many ways. Whether that would change if if the U.S. policy changed towards Saudi Arabia and there was a defense commitment and more pressure on Iran, I hope so. All right, we have four minutes left, so we're going to try to squeeze in one more question. Uh, we have from Allison Cipriani. Why is Egypt now building areas for civilians from Gaza? That was a shift because in the past they didn't want to let any civilians cross the border. Yeah, we have to see what how this all plays out. There's obviously a lot of reporting going on about construction going on on the Egyptian side, walls being built, encampments being built, um, stated opposition still to any displacement into Egypt. Um, when you so, saw, I think it was 60 Minutes had the foreign minister on um, talking from Munich, and uh, you've seen other comments being made by the Egyptians that appear to demonstrate that they won't allow anybody across the border. That is their stated position publicly right now, whether they're preparing for a contingency where they allow something to happen, be, be a very helpful development from a humanitarian perspective. 
Um, the fact that the Egyptians have evaded international condemnation or U.S. condemnation for not opening the border is a tragedy. I don't think uh, many of us spend enough time talking about that uh, when people talk about the humanitarian issues in Rafa or, or Gaza. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, I do believe that they are genuinely concerned for their own security. They believe that Hamas will move with civilian population flow, that these people will end up coming into Cairo. Uh, they'll have a massive security threat on their hands and they don't want any part of it. Uh, and whether that is morally unsound as a position um, does not change what their strategic assessment may be in Cairo. So we'll see. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming to Inside the Newsroom. We'd love to have you back. Um, and uh, have a good day, everyone.